recording so I didn't forget. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 160th meeting of Foswell Hyderabad. Foswell stands for Friends on Same Wavelength. And um, as many of you know, there are some uh, new attendees. This was started uh, over 20 years ago in Cupertino, California. And we have Mrs. Zuma Seshadri who has joined us from that chapter from California. The Hyderabad chapter was started about uh, a little over 13 years ago in 2009. And uh, we are in the 14th year. We meet on the third Saturday of every month. And we have met unfailingly without a break for the last 13 years, including during the lockdown and pandemic period. Uh, we just shifted to the I was speaking to Minnie and how quickly even senior citizens have all moved to this new platform called Zoom or video conferencing. So I'm you can continue to admit people. I think there are some people, yeah, thank you. So we'll begin the meeting with a prayer and um, to read the prayer to us today, uh, we have with us Karuna Bandakavi. Karuna is the daughter of our very dear and respected member Mr. Subaro Bandakavi, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Uh, he was a very active and participative member of uh, Foswell. Karuna is a, a, a young engineer. She went to ISP later. She's a data scientist and she is a co founder of a startup. 360 degree, what is it called, Karuna? It's called Photon 360. Yeah. Put on 360 and they do legal, accounting, consulting, auditing. Would you read the prayer for us, Karuna, this evening? Uh, prayer, yeah, prayer, by the, uh, oh, prayer by Krishna Pernini. Prayer by Krishna Pernini. I think I muddled up there. Karuna will come in later. Before that, we have Krish, um, is the son of our joint secretary. Krish is also an engineer. Then he has um, gone to work with Mahindra Satyam and is now currently based out of uh, New Jersey and is working with Scotia Bank. Am I right, Krish? Uh, it's the Bank of Montreal. Uh, that's a recent change, though. <laughs> a recent change. You guys, America, change your job by the weekend. <laughs> oh, <laughs> your dad is not updated, incidentally. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so would you like to read the prayer? I'm sorry for the mix-up. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, so today's prayer is Heaven of Freedom. So... Um, I'll start that now. Um, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where the knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken in, broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where the words come out of the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Thank you. This Rabindranath Tagore's prayer is standard across all Foswell chapters across the world. And we unfailingly read this to kick off our meetings. And now I introduced uh, Karuna a little prematurely, but she's going to talk to us every meeting of Foswell is an endowment lecture to celebrate the life of someone who is no longer with us. And uh, this month, the endowment is in the name of uh, Mr. Madhuri D. Sivaramakrishna, Krishna Rao, Dr. Sivaramakrishna Rao. And the logistics sponsorship is in the name of uh, Karuna's dad, Professor Bandakavi Subarao. So Karuna, would you briefly tell us about these two gentlemen? Thank you. So I think you're muted. You'll have to start again. Yeah. Okay. So am I audible now? Yes, you are. So President of Foswell, uh, Sri Venkateshwar Rao Garu, distinguished speaker of the day, Ms. Mini Menon, members of Foswell, and my dear friends, as you all know, and you just told. Uh, the purpose of our assembly today is to participate in the annual endowment lecture in memory of Dr. Shivarama Krishna Rao Madhuri, organized by Foswell. The brief uh, background of Dr. Shivarama Krishna, uh, Shivarama Krishna Rao. 
Uh, he was born in 1934 in Madras uh, to Dr. Samba Sivarao and uh, Srimati uh, Hanumayama. Uh, his father, uh, even in 30s, uh, uh, owning to his ex excellence, uh, academic brilliance, uh, could uh, attain MRCP from London post his graduation from Madras Medical College. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Sivaramakrishna Madhuredi lost his father at a very young age. His mother, who was also equally uh, well qualified, uh, took charge of both the kids, upbringing of both her kids. Dr. Sivaramakrishna Madhuredi and his sister, Srimadhi Vishalamma. Right from his early childhood, Dr. Shivaramakrishna Madhuradi was brilliant in his studies and like his father, he too joined Madras Medical College and continued to earn academic honors. Post earning his fellowship from the prestigious Royal College of Surgeons in England, he moved to US with his family, uh, where he continued with his medical practice till the very last day. He unfortunately passed away in 2013, but he was known for his care and concern for his patients. Dr. Shivaramakrishna Madhuradi, or Krish, who is fondly called, life has not just been successful, but also been very purposeful and remained as an example for many others. I feel that it is befitting for us to remember this great soul and pay our homage to him. His wife, Mrs. Savitri, and his two daughters, Dr. Lakshmi and Dr. Shanti, live in California and are happy to celebrate this event here in India annually. And on their behalf, I wish to thank Fossil for arranging this annual endowment lecture here in the month of April every year. And I would like to thank every one of you here for your presence and participation. Uh, now I'd like to uh, talk about uh, my father, uh, Shri Subarao Bandakavi, in whose name the logistics sponsorship is set up for every April. Uh, Subarao Bandakavi, or Bandakavi as he is known to many, was born in a middle class family. His father was a teacher and uh, his mother was a housewife. He was the second child among the seven children. He grew up in economic uh, difficulties where paying fee for one child would mean losing food for everyone else in the family. But due to his sheer brilliance and dedication, he earned uh, his engineering admission with no fee constraint in Andhra University. But engineering degree alone couldn't uh, contain his hunger for learning, and he continued his MTech from JNTU and MBA from Usmania University. He headed an MDC's CSR wing till his retirement, and post his retirement, he joined as head of the department MBA at Sri Devi Women's College in Hyderabad till his very last day. Mr. Bandakavi unfortunately lost his kidneys in the year 99 and was on dialysis for four years till he got a transplant. This incident did not stop Mr. Bandakavi from doing what he wanted, but doubly motivated him to live his second life fully. He dedicated, in his own words, the second innings to fulfill his dreams and in supporting and motivating people. Mr. Bandakavi was truly multi-talented personality. Along with his academic brilliance, he was extremely popular for being an amazing orator with a very great and clean sense of humor. His, he has been a big motivator for many people who lost hope due to organ failure. He also published multiple Telugu poetry books, scripted, directed, and produced many Telugu dramas and telefilms that won state level awards. Nothing could stop Mr. Bandakavi. And another example is that even after his retirement, he worked with Kalinga University to get his PhD degree. We lost Mr. Bandakavi in 2017, but his beliefs on equality for women, freedom for choice for every single person, irrespective of their caste, creed, religion, gender, economic strata, are the core values that we, his family members, operate with. I'm proud calling myself his daughter. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Karuna. I must add that uh, Mr. Subara was also a, a very good poet. He would come to the Foswell meeting and pen a poem there and then and read it out. And in every meeting, he would unfailingly thank his wife, Mrs. Surya Prabha, who is also on this call, who donated the kidney for him. So we're very happy that, uh, you know, you could join us, Karuna. Karuna, incidentally, also went to University of California in Santa Cruz for a year, I think, right? In between. That's right, for a year. Good. So glad you bring, you know, you and Chris bring down our average age. So we always are on the hunt for young people, you know, for the right reasons. I can bring my son too. He can I bring know. it further down. 
I think SS Prasad has his grandchild on his lap, so that will be very good to bring us our average down. So uh, let's move on. And uh, I was very fascinated when Nitin first told me about Mini and what she is uh, set up or founded. And uh, is it live history or live history India, Mini? I always said, I never asked Nitin. You're muted. You're muted. You have to. It's, it's live history. It's, it's a dedication to our, uh, the continuum of our living heritage and history. Heritage, yeah. And when I visited the website that Nitin pointed out to me, I was just blown away. I mean, uh, and uh, as a coincidence would have it, just this morning, a Google News item popped up on my phone, which was describing some of the traditions of India and why they came to be. Some simple things like eating before dark and how it is tied up to the intermittent fasting, which has become a fad now. Sitting down on the floor and eating and what is the physiological uh, uh, benefits of that as researched by some Western university or eating on a banana leaf. These are trivia which we have discarded as you know, you know, traditions which have no meaning, which have no basis. But I think uh, mankind has been uh, ignorant of uh, uh, their benefits and the scientific basis behind them. Likewise, uh, Mini's effort has been to unearth those aspects of our history, our heritage, which are not well chronicled. And that, uh, you know, just the concept itself blew me away. And uh, I was so happy that Nitin uh, suggested and brought uh, Mini on. But before we invite uh, Mini to present, Nitin, would you like to say a few words about Mini? Introduce sure, happy to. Good morning, good evening to all. Um, I first came across uh, Live History India, uh, I think it was a year, year and a half ago. And like Subha, I was sort of blown away by what Mini and her team are doing. So let me start off by giving a short bio of Mini and then turn it over to her. So Minnie Menon is the co-founder and editor of Live History India, a first of its kind digital platform on Indian history, heritage, and the stories that make India. Prior to turning entrepreneur, Minnie was the executive edit editor of Bloomberg TV India. She is a well-known face on Indian television and over the last 20 years, she has reported on political, business, and financial news with some of the biggest names in the Indian news broadcast space, including CNBC TV 18 and the Times Network. Mini has also authored a book called Riding the Wave, published by HarperCollins on seven of India's top business leaders. Mini has been awarded the Rajiv Gandhi Award for Excellence as a Young Achiever, the Z Astitva Award for Journalism, and in 2009, she was just the best business news anchor by the Indian Broadcasting Federation. In 2013, she was named one of the 10 most influential women in Indian media, marketing, and advertising by the Impact Magazine. Mini was the regional chairperson of CII's Indian Women Network. Uh, she has also been part of various industry bodies and was on the advisory board of international NGO Enactus and the CIIYA-led India at 75. She is a history graduate from St. Stephen's College in New Delhi. Mini has been a Chevening scholar and trained in broadcast journalism in India and in the UK. So Live History India brings together Mini's lifelong passion for the subcontinent's history and experience as a journalist. At a time when India is a rising power, as we heard Dr. Shet last month, a key component of that, I feel, is India's soft power, and that includes its history, culture, art, music, literature. So Live History India and Mini are playing a key role in this regard. So I, I feel we are in for a treat. So with that, over to you, Mini. Uh, thank you so much, Nitin. Thank you so much about, for, um, for this wonderful opportunity to take uh, to your um, group uh, the, the stories that make India and the work that we do. I must start by saying that, uh, you know, the idea of, of having friends from different arenas on the same wavelength 
coming together to open their minds, to hear different speakers, to, to expose themselves to different areas is so fascinating. And I think that at its very heart is what we are doing at Live History India as well, because we believe that history is for everyone. You know, in India, we are too used to living our life in silos. Uh, very often, if you're an engineer, you have no exposure to history. If you're a history graduate, you are a, someone who's building a career or a lifetime work in history, you have very little exposure to any other area of expertise. And I believe knowledge is this endless ocean, which uh, at every possible moment, at every possible time, adds on to your own understanding of yourself and the world around you. And, uh, uh, you know, we've been very blessed to have the opportunity to create a platform like Live History India, because uh, it's not something that, uh, you know, in my earlier avatar, I would have ever even dreamed of, of putting together. But as Nitin was reading out all of my <laughs> earlier roles, I was I just was feeling that it seems like a lifetime uh, apart. <laughs> and I think, you know, in the last five years, it's just been such a sea change for me. And the one thing I can be certain about um, as I go along in this journey of history is uh, uh, the first is that every day I feel blessed to be born in this amazing country. Um, and I feel so proud of what we have achieved as, as a nation, as a culture, as a civilization. And each day I also get to know how ignorant I am because you can spend multiple lifetimes trying to understand India, to grasp its uh, uniqueness, its, its depth, its width, et cetera, but a lifetime isn't enough. So I hope the work we do will continue and outlive all of us so that uh, the, the kind of journey that we have started becomes a dedication to the nation, dedication to the future generation, and we act as a bridge using technology between the past and the future of India, which I think would be really uh, something that would be a dream come true for me. But um, I thought uh, I've, I've got an, uh, about 45 minutes to talk to you. And I thought uh, I would take this opportunity uh, to take you on a journey, uh, a journey of discovery that I went through. And I want to share the excitement of that with you. And also, uh, by the end of this uh, talk, uh, hopefully you will get a sense of the myriad different stories that make India and why we chose stories that make India as a tagline and not uh, something uh, that we had started off, which is really rediscover, revive and restore Indian history. I, I, we thought that, uh, you know, this is a subject that will connect with everybody because in India, you know, we all love our history and we uh, love storytelling, right? So uh, that's, <laughs> that's the, uh, the, the kind of uh, prelude to this conversation. So uh, I'm going to take you on a quick journey through time and space. And because uh, we only have 45 minutes, I'm skipping most of history. I'm only concentrating to a large extent on the ancient Indian history, because that's my personal favorite. And every one of us has our own space, which we kind of, kind of connect with. And for me, it has been that. Now, um, as I said, I thought I knew history because I had spent uh, my college years doing history. I had, uh, you know, through my career as a journalist, I always had a history book by my bedside. And I, I felt uh, when I entered Live History India, I started Live History India, that I had a fair sense of history. Very soon, that bubble burst because I realized that I knew nothing of my own history. And, um, and that's why I feel that, you know, uh, a forum like this and forums like this are so wonderful to share some of the stories that we've come across, some of the short stories that we've been very privileged to kind of uh, chronicle. So uh, the question I open with is, where does the story of India really start? Now, I remember I, I didn't use when does the story of India really start, but where, because there is a reason behind this. And I take you to the first slide that I have, which is uh, uh, famous in the geological circles as the Palakkad Gap. Now, interestingly, the village that I come from, Ottopalam, is about uh, maybe half an hour away from, from Palagat. And uh, this is probably an area I would have crossed multiple times because you know we always, as, as kids, went to uh, Kerala and then we drove all over the place. And I'm sure many of you have done. So uh, Coimbatore was a, a haunt and from there to Kunur and then to Uti, et cetera. We did this every year. But I never realized until I started Live History India how significant the Palagat gap is. Because around 100 million years ago, 
when uh, the continents were forming and the Gondwana supercontinent was splitting. This was uh, connected to uh, another sliver, which was Madagascar. So when the Indian subcontinent moved away from Africa, uh, a piece of Madagascar was attached. In fact, that was part of a whole and this, it started moving. And the Palakkad Gap represents the point from which the Madagascar Island was pulled away from India's landmass as India made its way to the north towards Asia, the Asian uh, plate. Now, this is so significant because even today, if you actually put it together, the, there is a range in Madagascar which kind of fits in like a jigsaw to the Palagat Gap. And it's quite fascinating. Historically also, um, and I really believe that Indian history has a lot to do with the geography. And you can't look at history in isolation. So we really promote a multidisciplinary approach to understanding history because you can't understand history without understanding geography. And you'll, you'll through the course of this uh, talk, also come back to Palakkad Gap because this gap played a very significant role in trade because uh, ships would come to the ports of Kerala. You know, Musiris, uh, Patnam is one of the famous ports of Kerala. And traders would use this very gap to move to Coimbatore, where uh, a lot of the cotton uh, produced from the Deccan region would come in. And that's why Coimbatore's cotton was so famous. So everything is linked. And so I thought uh, I would start this talk with the Palakkad Gap, uh, 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 something that has been there forever and something that also tells you the story of India and how far back it goes. Interestingly, another place, I don't know how many of you are aware, but the Indian subcontinent was also home to a great universe of dinosaurs, many of them who were actually um, uh, native to India. So when we talk about the first Indians, should we talk about the dinosaurs as the first Indians or the humans? I mean, who's got the right to claim this land? But uh, this is a, a place in Gujarat, about 90 kilometers from Ahmedabad, the place called Balasinor, where you will discover the second largest dinosaur hatchery in the world. So this is an expanse of land uh, with uh, rolling, um, you know, uh, small hills uh, and in different parts, as part of the fossilized uh, stones, you will see eggs of dinosaurs. It's quite fascinating. And uh, this is originally in a small village called Raihole. And there is now a Raiholesaurus uh, who is native to this place. And uh, geologists and paleontologists from the world over come to uh, see this uh, wonderful park. Also, it tells you how uh, the two events are connected, the moving of the Indian subcontinent and the end of the dinosaurs. Because uh, most of you who have uh, been around uh, Bombay and, and Maharashtra would have seen the great Deccan traps. Now the Deccan traps were caused because of the lava flowing out of an, a volcano that happened many, many millions of years ago. And it is believed that that volcano was also the reason uh, for the end of, or it was timed along with the end of dinosaurs on earth because uh, the theory is that a big asteroid hit uh, Mexico and it created ripples across the world and in the, the Reunion Islands and on the Indian Ocean, there was this massive volcano that happened, which kind of spread the lava and that marked the end of the dinosaurs. So every time I look at the Deccan traps on the way to Lunavla, I think about the poor dinosaurs who lost their lives <laughs> as the Deccan traps were being formed. So that's uh, really the connection of history, which I, I thought was very, very interesting. Also connected with this geological past, is uh, another very interesting space, which is uh, the caves of Meghalaya. Because uh, as the Indian subcontinent was moving towards Asia, a lot of the sea was, was, was uh, kind of uh, uh, lost or taken in by the land. And uh, what we have in the caves of Meghalaya, which are, by the way, famous across the world, and we've done a lovely film on the caves of Meghalaya, they are a geological wonder. And uh, did you know that the age that we are living in is called the Meghalayan age because it starts about 4,300 years ago. And in the stalagmites inside the caves of Meghalaya, they have found evidence of, um, of time zones and an environmental disaster that they believe was uh, part of the, uh, the, the ripple of environmental disasters that led to the collapse of the Bronze Age civilizations across the world, including the Harappans. And hence this era is called the 
the, the era of Meghalaya, the Meghalayan age. Now these caves are beautiful because within them you'll find fossils and, um, and uh, pieces of sharks that would have roamed around the, the seas uh, around Meghalaya. And also, uh, I remember reading in the Indica, a wonderful book by uh, Pranay Lal, who's a biochemist, uh, uh, the fact that uh, before Australia, Antarctica and India kind of split up in this great journey towards Asia, uh, Meghalaya and Adelaide in Australia would have been just a couple of kilometers apart. So you can't even fathom how these, uh, these uh, continents would have been. And interestingly, uh, the Vivekananda rock uh, which, which we all know of, uh, which we most of us must have seen, was a point where these three continents split up. And so there is a, a very interesting story behind that as well. So this is really uh, uh, a snapshot of where the history of India starts. And it also is very humbling because uh, we think that we own this land, we are the people who shape this land. But long before any of us were even thought of in the evolutionary uh, journey, this land has its own, had its own story. And it is often described by uh, geologists as the rock star of its age, because the journey that the Indian subcontinent took uh, to meet up with, um, with the Asian subcontinent or Asian, Asian plate was seen as something which was really spectacular. So as you would notice, my second favorite subject after history is geology. And I'm a novice at it, but I feel that, you know, I want to spend a large part of my life discovering these fabulous uh, stories. So um, another very interesting thing. So through this talk, I thought I'll tell you about some of these little stories that we've come across and also the lessons that one has learned from these stories, uh, because it does uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, gel in with the larger story of India and the evolution of our uh, civilization. The new discoveries and the continuity of history. This is another very, very interesting uh, area because uh, the obvious aspect is, of course, you know, we are so connected with the uh, Gangetic Plains and geography and the, uh, the rise of the cities and everybody knows about Kashi, etc. But the continuity of Indian history goes further back. And I want to start with this gentleman that you see uh, who's sitting on a stool talking to two people. Um, now this is Shu Ilishu. Uh, it's a very famous little, little seal that uh, you'll find at the Louvre in Paris. It is from the Akkadian period uh, in uh, uh, Sumer, ancient Sumer. And it tells the story of the interpreter from Meluha, a man who was probably out there uh, helping Indian tradesmen um, sell their goods uh, in, uh, in the Akkadian uh, capital. And uh, his name was Shi, Shu Ilishu. We know that, of course, you know that uh, the Harappan script has not been deciphered. So it's very important to um, kind of hang on to small clues like this, which tell you about the life and times of the people um, of the Harappan civilization. Interesting, you see the pagri or, or, the, or, or, the, uh, or the headgear that the, this uh, interpreter of Meluha is uh, wearing and you would find something similar even today in Rajasthan and Gujarat, which is very interesting. I found it very interesting because the headgear is so different from the others. So Shu Ilushu is, a, is perhaps the first person from the Indian subcontinent to be uh, identified, to be uh, pointed out as an individual, but we know very little about him except for the seal. We know nothing about him actually, but it also tells you about how the Harappan civilization was, you know, often, People talk about the Egyptian civilization, the Mesopotamian with the ziggurats, the Egyptians with their great, uh, great pyramids. But uh, the Harappan civilization, the one thing that made the civilization go around, it seems, was trade and money and commerce. And you'll see uh, this is a smattering of the many, many sites of the Harappan civilization that hug the Indus uh, Valley or Indus Basin and uh, uh, the basin of the old uh, Ghagar uh, Hakra rivers, uh, which kind of disappeared because of the environmental um, change. Uh, it shows you a concentration of, uh, of sites. And what I find interesting is that we see this 
in today's uh, sense, because this is how the land formation is. But if you were to rewind about 2000, uh, 3000 years ago or 3500 years ago, the geography would have been very different. And what you would have had were a number of little towns uh, hugging uh, water bodies, uh, because uh, both the great run of Kutch and the small run of Kutch, little run of Kutch were actually uh, seas, what, shallow seas, and Dholavira, which is still in an island, would have been uh, an important island city surrounded by water, and ships and boats would have come across uh, um, the Ar Arabian Sea coming into these sites. Also, I didn't realize that uh, one of the reasons that Gujarat has so many sites is because it was also the base for carnelian, which was the most popular bead for jewelry in the very ancient world. So this is a very uh, interesting uh, map uh, because uh, recently uh, we, I started the year with a, a bout of COVID and I spent that time actually going through a 700 page report on Lothal. And then I use some geo uh, satellite maps because now Google allows you to do that. And I found the most amazing aspects because what has happened is that Lothal, uh, you know, we know from the archaeological reports that Lothal was destroyed because a series of tidal waves hit Lothal around 2000, 2000-1900 BC and so forth. And even today, uh, the Gulf of Kambat is dangerous because of its tidal waves. And uh, that is why you will not find any of the ports uh, in that area. In fact, that's not an area that you can see ports in. Also, what you will see on satellite imagery is that of dried images of dried river beds, beds around Lothal. So today Lothal is deep into the land, but at that time it was on the river, on the sea. Now, um, another interesting uh, aspect uh, in Lothal is when I went over there, uh, there was a tale of a, a little temple dedicated to Sakotri, Sikotri Mata, um, a local goddess. Um, uh, the temple was apparently on the mound uh, under which the, the dockyard and the various buildings of Lothal were later excavated. And uh, S.R. Rao, who was the archaeologist in charge, uh, had to reorient uh, the temple, I mean, uh, demolish the temple and place it elsewhere. And this kind of made a lot of the locals very upset because the entire area is full of Sikotari Mata uh, temples. If you see uh, on a Google map, if you if you search Sikotari Mata, you'll find a, a, a spread of that across Lothal, down to Baruch, all the way to Surat and that entire area. Now you might wonder who Sikotari Mata is. And for that, you don't have to go very far because uh, on the mouth of the Red Sea is an island called Sokotra, which was the pit stop for a lot of the traders going into the Red Sea area and Egypt. And Sokotra is, uh, where the Sikotari Mata comes from. And, you know, it is uh, something that, uh, that traders would have worshipped, a, a goddess the traders would have worshipped. And that continuum of Sikotari Mata is still there today. Now, if this is the West Coast, on the East Coast in Odisha, you will have, uh, in Bhuvneshwar every year, you have the Bali Yatra, which is another very interesting uh, old tradition where uh, women put... Uh, paper boats into the, into the river, going into the sea, because this also marked the beginning of a journey into the Bay of Bengal trade network. So India has been really surrounded by trade uh, and, uh, and uh, networks. And I thought the story of Sikotari Mata was really so amazing. In fact, even Matani Pachedis, you'll have uh, Vahanvati Mata, which is again a, a goddess on a boat. And I would like to get back to this map uh, because the other thing that stood out for me as a journalist who's covered business for so long is that this is the area where three of India's most, uh, um, uh, I would say, successful business communities come from too. You have the Sindhis who come from the Indus Valley. You have the Marwadis who come from the Rajasthan belt. And you have the Gujaratis who uh, you know, uh, dominate. So the tradition, and you, it's not difficult to understand why, because again, geography plays an important role. Because if you're in this part of India, it's easier to go across and trade with uh, West Asia and the Horn of Africa and Africa than go towards the East, uh, especially if you're in Rajasthan, because on the East, you have a, have a desert, uh, which kind of blocks your way. And these river networks going into the sea played such an important role 
in trade. So this is the story of Sikotari Mata, which really blew my mind because you know it just shows uh, the continuity. And I can do a you know a, a two-day lecture on the Harappan civilization and the many many things that we found because um, it's really amazing. Though a lot of work has been done on it, uh, uh, the gap between what is publicly available on the Harappan civilization and what has been found is huge, and we are trying to bridge that. Um, this also brings me to another uh, subject, which is the great mysteries in Indian history. You know, uh, while we know a lot about our history, there's a lot that we don't know about. And that's what fascinates me. Sometimes I feel that, you know, uh, uh, and very often it happens that uh, we want to do a story, there isn't any material on it. And I land up uh, doing the story because I then have to talk to five historians in five across the globe, try and piece together the story. And it's, a, it's almost the work of an archaeologist, <laughs> only we are digital archaeologists. <laughs> you know, we we have to dig up the stories uh, uh, in different ways through research, through excavation reports, etc. But there's some fascinating mysteries around Indian history, and I'm going to start with uh, uh, this site. I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, in Andhra Pradesh. It's called Jawalapuram. Now, it's I, I read it for I read about it first when I was reading Pranay's book uh, or, or the Indica. Because uh, this is a site uh, which has captured, in fact, uh, a moment in history uh, from 74,000 years ago. So uh, 74,000 years ago in the island of Sumatra, there was the great volcano of Tabo, which was uh, perhaps a uh, hundred times uh, more lethal than any volcano that man has known, even the one in, in the Vesuvius, uh, which led to the collapse of a large part of the, um, the Roman civilization. Now, uh, um, uh, the Tabo uh, volcano was so bad that it, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the air from that kind of spread across uh, uh, the globe and it went on for 10 long years. And soon, pretty much a large part of this region was covered in the shroud of, of volcanic uh, discharge. And uh, there was a settlement over here of Homo sapiens, uh, which kind of got buried on in time. So when they started digging through J Jalapuram, they found an ash layer. And under the ash layer, they found tools and reference to a human settlement over here. What is interesting about it is, of course, there are settlements all over the place, but what is interesting is that this particular find turned on its head uh, the idea of the out of Africa theory, which claims or, or points towards the fact that between um, around uh, 70,000 70, uh, uh, years ago, a group of people came out of Africa and kind of spread across the world. Uh, and that was a homo sapien group. So the fact that there was a group of people living here uh, in 74, 74,000 years ago kind of made people question the very basis of this. And post that, we've had a number of other discoveries, which only goes to say that our knowledge of history is based on what was found in the last excavation. And it is a process. It is a work in progress. So I'm often asked, isn't history subjective? Isn't history about interpretation? No, history is a science like anything else. And like other sciences, like physics or chemistry, every new discovery opens up a new vista, a new horizon, and adds on to our knowledge. So history is a work in progress. We're still discovering a large part of India's history. Of course, uh, this is a, a site that uh, everyone uh, is very familiar with in these days. It's a site that has got a lot of media attention. It's a site of Keeladi in uh, Tamil Nadu. And there are claims that this is home to a great civilization, etc. And uh, I'm sorry, but the problem is that very often we use terms like civilization very, very loosely. And the moment we do use a term like civilization, we're comparing it to Egypt or Mesopotamia or, or Harappa, which is not right. Because actually, even when the Harappan civilization was on, there were a, a, a whole bunch of sites across India which were at different stages of evolution. And the importance of Keeladi is that it has taken back um, uh, the Iron Age in the South by about 300 years to 600 BCE. And it shows that by 600 BCE, people were actually living over here and had very, very mature settlements up. What is also interesting is the story 
that uh, is this map that I came across. Now, this is uh, the Vaigai River, which uh, drains into Madurai and then into the Bay of Bengal. And what you see over here are uh, the excavation sites or archaeological sites from the um, Mesolithic, Stone Age, and Early Iron Age. And you will see just how many they are. This is one river in India. And the Vaigai uh, has the more, I mean, a, a intense number of sites, different layers of evolution, which also tells you that India was fairly well populated. And we only think of, it's as though the rest of India disappeared because everything was in the Harappan civilization. It's not true. There are about 13 different cultures that coexisted with the Harappan period. And this one river stream will tell you just how many uh, amazing sites there are in India much of it not discovered and sadly many of it getting many of them getting destroyed every year as we speak because of the problem of a not chronicling them not putting out uh, the details about them and b uh, the spread of cities towns villages uh, means that uh, very often they are just bulldozed through and that brings will bring me to another area of the work that we are doing which really needs all the attention and all the support but uh, another very interesting place that I went to uh, and I uh, did a film on was Sinoli. Again, like Keeladi, it's a very, very famous site. Uh, it's um, uh, on the Yamuna Dwab, you know, on, on the Yamuna site. And it's a very interesting place uh, because let me tell you about the site itself. This is a necropolis, a massive burial site from the Copper Age, the Copper Horde culture, which is dated to around 2000 BCE. What is amazing over here is that this skeletal remains of women warriors. There are references to the possibility of a chariot. Uh, of course, there is debate on it, but uh, a large body, including the archeologists working, I believe that it is a horse driven chariot, which again questions the whole idea that horses came much later into India. What also it shows is that uh, this was a, a very military weapon-led community of people in a place which is very close to Panipat and Kurukshetra, uh, which is about 100 kilometers from the Hastinapur site. So of course, people put two and two together and said, oh, is this a site of the Mahabharat? Or is this a site of a community that was there? It is not because we don't know anything about that. What we do know about it is the fact that it was a group, a necropolis of, 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 of warriors. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it has, it's full of copper, um, copper, um, uh, you know, weaponry. And another very interesting thing I found over there was the skeletons had their feet tied up and cut from the ankle down, which is again, a tradition that goes back even in Inamgaon in Maharashtra, you have the same kind of burials. So the, the, uh, it sounds macabre, but <laughs> some of these burials do indicate the story of what the belief systems were, or the cultures were. But what I'm trying to tell you is, there is so much of India's history that we don't know. And what we need to spend time, energy, effort to try and unveil, understand, study. Because uh, there's this huge gap and it has led to a lot of debate, a debate that kind of dominates everything in history about the Aryan invasion and all of that, all of which is really been, uh, been uh, you know, uh, addressed very, very effectively by historians and archaeologists who worked on the space. Because the learning now is that there wasn't any kind of invasion, but a dispersal of, of um, habitation and people after this calamity that happened around 2000 BC. And there were many, many communities around. And what India witnessed was also witnessed in Greece with the Minoans and the Mycenaeans and in Mesopotamia and Egypt. So there is a, there is a connection to everything that has happened because man's journey has been parallel. And, and that's something that always amazes me that we think that we are in an island, but somewhere, somewhere else, uh, uh, sometime else, there has been a parallel movement of, of ideas, of technology, which we have been part of. Now this uh, kind of segues into the next topic, which is India and the world. You know, we've always seen India as a subcontinent, uh, you know, protected by the Himalayas up north and the seas down south and deserts on the west and forests on the east. And we think it is isolated, but through history, we saw the map of the Harappan world, but through history, one of the things that uh, 
the subcontinent has done is it's always been open to trade, to commerce, to people, to, to different influences that have come in. And uh, uh, that has always made it interesting. The other misnomer is that the subcontinent's history is, uh, is in togetherness. It's not. Because if you actually study history in India, you are actually dividing the Indian subcontinent into many parts. And uh, I remember, um, you know, one of the advisors on uh, Live History India is Gautam Sengupta, who was a last archaeologist to be the director general of archaeology. And he pointed out a very interesting thing to me. He said, you know, India is actually a sum of many parts. And every time a great dynasty or empire has collapsed, these multiple parts have come up again. And culturally, we know that because uh, in Kerala, you have Malabar and Travancore, two, two parts of the small little state, but two very different parts. In uh, Tamil Nadu, you have Kongonada, you have Cholanada, you have, uh, you know, um, uh, different parts again. So every, Tondai Nada. So in uh, Bihar, you have Darbhanga, you have uh, Mithila, very, very different regions. So every time uh, uh, um, a centri centrifugal empire has broken up, it has gone back into parts. And that brings me to this broad regions that we have kind of divided into. Because you see the micro parts, this is where it kind of connects. So there is a Gangetic plain from, from, I would say, Lahore to Bengal, which really has a common thread of history because that's where all the empires come in. Gujarat is part of it because on the West Coast, coast it opens up into the sea out there. You have the Deccan, which has a history of its own. And this goes back to the uh, Neolithic period because I remember talking to uh, the head of ICHR in Bangalore and he pointed out a very interesting thing. That Bangalore is between two, two streams, literally. And what is interesting is both sides of the stream have two different cultures. One connected more with Mysore, one connected more with, with Andhra, which is uh, Anandpur and that side. And from the Neolithic times, the burial patterns have been different. So even a small sliver like uh, Bangalore, which is actually on the tip of the Deccan Plateau, uh, has such different variances. Then you have the Northeast, which has had its own drumbeat, so to say, from history, because it's connected very closely to Burma, to Indochina, etc. You have the Chota Nagpur Plateau and the Malwa Plateau, the Gond land, which is a thickly forested land. Today, you have all your tiger reserves over there, your Kanha, Bandhavgarh, all of these. And it's a sliver of forest that is in the, in the heart of India. It's also the territory where you have all the Naxal violence, because that's the Naxal stretch as well. Then you have Ladakh, which was always connected uh, to the north, uh, the central um, uh, Asian, uh, you know, grasslands and, uh, and Tibet. And you have Jammu and Kashmir, which is literally a little valley within a cup protected on all sides by the Himalayas. So this uh, I found very interesting because when we all and then you have the coastal region and most of the development uh, civilizationally in South India has been uh, driven by coastal cities, driven by trade. So you have Madura, you have Korkai, you have um, Musiris or Patnam. So all these cities uh, were trading cities and that's what brought the wealth into the hinterland. And this of course is a very famous map. The first map that you see on top is the great uh, silk route uh, which with many, many arms and legs. But uh, the, the route that you see over here is an even older route, which is the route that connected Takshila to Patliputra, Tamralipti, and beyond. And this was the Uttarapath. This was a great highway, uh, which continues to be a major highway today. Uh, and uh, it over here intersected to create the Dakshinapath, which went up to Paitan or Pratisthan. Now, this is very interesting because you can't see any trading route in India in isolation. They're always connected to something larger. And if this was a uh, on land route, if you see the sea route, you will see how how uh, amazingly uh, uh, you know uh, rich our ports were, and uh, how they were kind of dotted our coastline completely. One of my favorite maps that we use a lot is the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. It was done by a Greek mariner. Uh, the original version was. Uh, perhaps around the first century CE, which is about 2000 years ago. And if you uh, zoom in to this map and the coastline of uh, India, you will actually come across some very familiar names like uh, uh, Upara, which is Sopara, 
which is now a very very horrible grubby uh, suburb of india of mumbai which is nala sopara you will come across muziris of course patnam you will come across barigaza which is baruch uh, and you will also come across patli botra which is really patna or patli putra so this is a map and what i find amazing about this map is that you know most maps today have europe at the center of the map so it's a eurocentric map with the world around europe this is a map with the indian subcontinent at the center because the indian subcontinent acted as a connector between the the west and the east it was the place where um, most of the world's great luxury items or the known world's great luxury items came be it ivory be it pepper be it um, cotton and this was really the place to be it's only later in fact but in this map you don't have a reference to china china was not known through the sea route at this point it's only after this point that you start getting uh, ships going deeper and deeper into the hinterland and uh, and or, or traders going deeper into the hinterland and really populating it so this uh, map for me is a uh, very very special uh, it's a map that we use a lot because it gives you a a a, a kind of point of comparison of how trade and how networks happened this uh, comes to a much later later period i've got only two three slides of the medieval era but um, this is another very interesting um, uh, network of course we all know the chola empire and the chola uh, influence uh, across southeast asia was very great but there was there are references to a group of 500 great merchants uh, who uh, originally came from aihole which was the chalukya capital and they kind of controlled the straits and all the trade uh, into the east uh, this was starting the 9th century so if you think of the colonial powers the dutch the french the british who came in much and the portuguese who started it all in the from the 15th 16th century this was a good 600 years before that indian traders the great lords of the sea as they were called were uh, were roaming the seas and uh, you know creating great mercantile empires now uh, you have the merchant guild of aihole there is also an interesting merchant uh, guild that i came across in the west coast in kerala which uh, included syrian christian traders uh, jews and arabs which really is what kerala's uh, you know demographics also suggest because it's a equally spread uh, population of uh, of hindus christians and muslims and that kind of shows just how cosmopolitan this whole area was i wanted to also introduce you uh to four amazing indians uh, who really stand out for me again they are from four different eras of history and um uh the first one is a personal favorite we've all heard of chandragupta maurya who uh, of course was a founder of uh, the mauryan empire but his uh, grandson gets a lot of credit and a lot of attention but for me the real hero is uh, chandragupta maurya because uh, also because we didn't know a lot about him for a very long time his his name or uh, his presence was kind of referred to in different um texts but uh, we didn't have a real knowledge of him and it's interesting because uh, the first hint of who this great empire builder was comes from um, in the 18th century i think william jones uh, the 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 person the jurist and the and the polymath who set up the asiatic society in calcutta um, came across uh, um, a work by plutarch in which uh, plutarch was a, a, a historian uh, who wrote around the first century uh, ce and he refers to a meeting between alexander and this young boy called sandricotus uh, who was just about 20 who later went on to defeat the king of magda magad and uh, the the empire of magad was of course so powerful that alexander's forces refused to go and fight them and that's the point at which he turned back from india and putting two and two together they realized that what the sandricotus that was being mentioned was really chandragupta maurya and this chandragupta maurya was uh, and we all know the story of how chanakya found him in a village outside patliputra he went to takshila to study he came back he formed the empire and what's amazing is that at the height of his empire uh, as an emperor he gave it all up to become an ascetic he uh, donned uh, 
uh, the garb of a Jain monk and went to uh, Shavana Belagola in Karnataka and uh, died, uh, you know, in the most, uh, you know, of course, uh, the, the, the Jains have this lekha, which is really the, where you starve yourself to death, and he did that. And this was to save his country or his kingdom from a very, very lethal drought. So this is a story of a boy who with great, uh, you know, uh, ambition goes, be becomes an empire builder only to give it up at the height of his glory. And this story really resonated with me because uh, India is the only country where you actually come across a story like this. There isn't a, another place in the world where you'll have an emperor giving it up. And of course his grandson follows suit, but uh, his grandson gets all the attention. Chandragupta Maurya sadly does not. Another very interesting character from history is Mir Jumla. I don't know how many of you have heard him, uh, heard about him, but um, he was really the mover and shaker of the 17th century in India. He starts off as a, a very poor Persian uh, boy who uh, becomes an apprentice with a trader, comes to Golconda, uh, becomes a diamond merchant, becomes the prime minister of, no, first he manages Masulipatnam, the port, then he becomes the prime minister of uh, Golconda. Uh, he plays politics with the Mughals. Uh, and in every capacity, he becomes larger than the patron. Uh, so he becomes larger than the Qutub Shahi ruler at that time. He famously gave the Kohinoor to Shah Jahan. It, Kohinoor, we know, was from the Golconda mines. He goes on to become the prime minister of the Bengal Subha. And he is in any story of any part of, uh, of India in the 17th century, you will find the shadow of Mir Jumla, uh, you know, behind. And I thought it was a very interesting uh, story because we know so much, so little about it. And that just indicates that while we know, we think we know our history, there is so many aspects of our history that we don't know of. Ahilya Bai Holkar is another very, very interesting lady. Uh, we've done a lot of work on her. We just did a film on her. And uh, in the 18th century, when India was, uh, you know, facing drought, famine, uh, wars, and it was utter chaos, there's this widow who, in the heart of India and central India, from a capital in Maheshwar, uh, you know, sat on the throne and managed one of the most efficient um, administrative, administra administered kingdoms in the country. And she left her mark because if you see any of the great pilgrim centers of India from Ramanathapuram to Dwaraka to Kashi Vishwanath, she sat and single-handedly spent money to restore all of this. It's quite a phenomenal story. And, um, you know, I, I, I look at uh, business leaders today and we talk about business case studies. I feel that Ahilya Bhai Holkar really deserves a case study of her own. And that's what we have tried to do in the film on Ahilya Bhai Holkar because what are the chances of a widow in the 18th century rising above her lot and actually shaping so much of the subcontinent uh, single-handedly? So this is another great story that you uh, must come across. Uh, I'll, uh, the last person I want to introduce you to is Ambaji Shinde, who is the most recent of our, uh, of our personalities uh, because um, he died in 2003 and his obituary was carried, in fact, a full article was carried in the New York Times, in the, in the Guardian, in all the leading uh, papers in the world, because he was the most famous jewelry designer of his era. And uh, he designed jewelry for Elizabeth Taylor, the Queen of England, and the who's who of the world. He started off his life as uh, the son of a poor bangle maker from Goa. And uh, in one lifetime, between 1917 and 2003, he dominated uh, the, the corridors of high design and uh, couture in the world. So it's a phenomenal story of Ambaji Shinde. So the idea behind these four stories from four different parts of uh, history is to just iterate for you how there is so much to learn from our history. There's so many interesting and inspirational people. Often history becomes just a list of rulers and invaders, etc. But Indian history is far richer and we really need to start looking at these people and telling their stories. Uh, I started with uh, Palagar and I'm going to go back to Kurungalur, uh, which is, uh, of course, the site of the old port city of Musiris or Patnam. Uh, it's like everything in history, it's also hotly debated and uh, there's a lot of politics around it right now. We won't get into that. 
But what um, is interesting about Kodangalur is uh, just in case you don't know, this is where the Musiris project uh, uh, is uh, has been conducted, which is really uh, trying to rediscover the port of Musiris. And they excavated over here and they found part of a very old port um, system. So they believe that that is Musiris or, or Patnam. And over here, within a five kilometer radius, you'll find India's oldest mosque, which is a Cheraman Juma mosque in Kodangalur. You will find the oldest church uh, in per Paragur, uh, which is also over there. Uh, you will find the synagogue. Of course, this is a Paradesi synagogue of Kochi, but you'll find uh, the Paragur synagogue, which is considered the oldest synagogue uh, in India. And you will find the Kodangalur Bhagwati temple, which is also um, uh, the temple that uh, the great Sangam epic, uh, Silapadi Karikam, uh, heroine, uh, Kanagi goes and immolates herself or, or dies over here. So this shows how old this is. And Sangam literature, we know, is from the second, third century CE. So what I'm trying to say is that this is one place uh, where within a five kilometer radius, you have all of these different faiths reflected. And the beauty of it is that each of these religious institutions are also living temples, living mosques, living churches, where service continues even today. So we often think of religion in conflict. We think of uh, the, the aggression that comes with faith uh, when you talk about Indian history. But uh, for me, Kodungalur stands out as a place where, uh, which has really been the gateway of faiths into India and where the continuum of the secular fabric that India has been known for through history continues to prosper and flourish. Now, while all of this storytelling is fun and we can continue for hours and hours uh, with the storytelling, the fact is that why are these stories important? The stories are important because unless we know where we came from, we don't know where we are going. And as a nation, we are a, a, a culturally rich nation, historically rich nation with an appalling apathy towards our history and our, uh, our past. A lot of our past is uh, in the hands or the, at least the discussion of our past is in the hands of politicians or uh, ideologues who are trying to use history for divisive politics. And I believe that is doing such disservice to this country, to this nation with such fantastic layers and layers of history that it is really sad. And that is our attempt really to tell the story of India in all its multiple parts, to say that how are we small parts of a whole and how that whole has had a continuum through time. And we are just cogs in the wheel and we should never forget that there is a larger uh, you know, message in history that comes through. Personally, I feel that you know, I started traveling to our sites uh, as a history student uh, to, almost two, two and a half decades ago. And every time I've gone back to the sites, I've always felt very sad because uh, they're in a very bad condition. We have very, very little regard to the way we keep our sites. Uh, most of them are at terrible risk. And you know, there, there's one thing that uh, um, unites India. It is apathy towards our heritage. and. Uh, I can vouch for it as a journalist who's covered uh, politics and business and finance that uh, any government, right, left, center, extreme right, extreme left, the one thing they have in common is nobody really cares about our heritage. And it's very sad because I often think that when our kids and their kids grow up, what are they going to see of India? When you talk about India's great cultural heritage, what are they going to see? Are they going to see any monuments? Are any monuments going to remain? And how sad will it be that uh, we lose touch with the real stories of India, the real stories that make us what we are. So I've got three uh, monuments that I want to show you, which also iterates my point that if there's one thing common across the country, it is the apathy. The first is a temple. It is a Jogeshwari case. We've just put out a, a documentary. In fact, we've just launched another series on heritage matters, the state of our urban heritage. And uh, the Jogeshwari Caves are a sixth century cave complex, uh, Shaivite cave, cave complex, surrounded by slums. It's, a, it's so appalling that um, there is sewer uh, leakage, you know, the, the leakage coming into the uh, main shrine itself. There are slums over and uh, public interest litigation was filed to try and move the slums. 
the slums have been some of the slums have been uh, kind of uh, demolished but the the rubble of the slums continues and uh, most of the sculptures which are a precursor to the elephanta caves really uh, because they are they are 100 years older than the elephanta caves have just disappeared so it's it's a very very sad state of affairs and for me this temple represents all that is wrong with the way we look at history because it's a temple where devotees go every day and yet nobody really has looked around no authority has come in to kind of save it another place is the ruins of a citadel of saint sebastian uh, in vasai uh, it's a 15th uh, century uh, gothic city anywhere in the else in the world this would have been one of the greatest tourist uh, places uh, possible because it's hauntingly beautiful but over there you go there and you'll just find empty ruins there's hardly any signage there is absolutely nothing and it's so sad that a city like mumbai that gets so many international visitors has not been able to kind of develop a site like this and nurture it because tourism can be such a great enabler for local communities and to get funds to actually uh, support these monuments uh, the last is this place called ashtur in in near bidar it's in the outskirts of bidar it's the ashtum ashtur tombs and the first one over here is the tomb of ahmed uh, wali shah who was a bahmani king it's a 15th century tomb complex and you will see this and this comes out of almost like when you go there you can't imagine that you're seeing something like this because uh three fourth of this dome has completely disappeared and if you go to the uh ahmed ali shah um ahmed shah wali's tomb over here the first of this you'll be amazed at the work inside if you think alhambra is beautiful you should just have a look at the ashtur tomb because it is just exquisite and the pity is that while it's exquisite all you can see over there are bat droppings and it's in such a mess i think 2000 the archaeological survey came and used some technology to kind of scrape away the 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 mess that the bats had left and what emerged was this beautiful black and red tapestry it's almost like a persian carpet across the do dome in the interiors but nobody cares about it and it's just lying there getting lost and i don't think it's going to last uh, more than a couple of years so what we are trying to do with our stories is you know at one level helping people rediscover our history because we believe that only when you know about our history will we be able to revive and restore what we are losing if we don't know how do we know what to say and the revival and restoration is so important because time is running out and i do believe that it's not a faceless government sitting 30000 feet above us who is going to be able to do uh, justice to what we what needs to be done it needs to be communities local communities that stand up for the monuments around them tell their story and understand the importance of it i think it needs ownership and that's something that we are working towards um, so we have uh, our website live history india where you will find over 5000 articles over 300 400 films on different sites of india and uh, we cover eras people places monuments living culture art history heritage practice all sorts of things and we are working with over 150 historians authors etc we've been at it story by story but i can tell you that we've not even touched the tip of the iceberg and i i would need multiple lifetimes to be able to you know consolidate and curate the history of india but this is an important first step because i was very keen that we create a platform like this because it's time we told the story of our uh, history you know it's important to get a uh, insider's view and i love the fact that such interesting work is being done by regional uh, historians on different regions of india and i think that's very important because it's important to understand that india is multilayered multilingual multi uh, cultural and we need to tell everybody's story so uh, what we are positioning live history india is uh, as the your digital gateway into india because uh, uh, like subha was saying uh, you know uh, the pandemic has uh, made digital come alive and legitimized digital and the very fact that i'm sitting over here in mumbai talking to all of you and telling you about this great uh, uh, project that we have started this shows how boundaries and geographical barriers don't matter anymore we also believe that india is so vast and so large that it will be very difficult for you to see all the places they are to see 
So we can act as a conduit for you and take you for virtual tours into the different parts of India. And we're running a series uh, on the must-see places in India, uh, which uh, of course I will tell you a little bit more about. So we have fascinating destinations. We have um, finest treasures. So we've got a series with the curators of the top museums across the world uh, with India collections, and they take us through their collections uh, on LHI Circle. Uh, we have virtual tours. So we started with Mohenjo Daro. We have Dhola Vira, Lothal, Nalanda, all the must-see places in the country. We are gradually opening up month after month. Uh, so this is a very exciting journey because having spent my a large part of my career on television with those bulky satellites and you know satellite footprints and you know uh, hundreds of crores of cost, <laughs> I'm very happy to see that on the digital platform we can do so much with with of course, limited resources, but yet we do find uh, a lot of patrons, a lot of people who come out and support us because they understand the importance of what we are doing and the need for a platform like this. So we also like to introduce uh, different aspects uh, in our understanding of history. So we have a lot of geology and you will see this in this film, like uh, the secrets of Ladakh, for instance, we have history, so you have tales of Shah Jahanabad and many such films like that. And we also look a lot at contemporary literature at, of different eras and periods to try and understand uh, the shape of things or, or how societies uh, thought and, and the ideas that emanated from them. So uh, in 2019, no, 2020, actually in the height of the pandemic, we also launched a uh, an e-commerce company um, with the tagline, own a piece of history, because we've done so much of work with the artisans of India that many of them approached us to say that, can you support us? Because during the pandemic, as we know that most of them were in very, very dire straits. So we launched People Tree, which is uh, an interesting space uh, because we're also doing some fun stuff. Like you can see over here, we've got the Harappan girl, the dancing girl of Mohenjo-daro, uh, which, uh, which we have, uh, done using the same technique that the Harappans use, which is the wax, lost wax technique. And interestingly, in that Gond belt uh, in the Central Asia, in Central India, which many people believe that, you know, is uh, perhaps the oldest Indians live there, uh, the tribes in Bastar, in West Bengal, etc., still practice the same art of lost wax um, uh, technique. And we got one of our artisans from the tribal belt over there to create, recreate uh, the Harappan girls. So it's one of our hottest sellers uh, on, on, uh, on People Tree. We also have started replicating, having some fun with history. We've got a lot of the Harappan seals available uh, and uh, they're quite interesting because, you know, I just love them. I've got a whole bunch of them in our house. We've got some of the old arts. By the way, you know, you, you, uh, out of Hyderabad, you know, you, you'll all be very familiar with the Ikkat. And this is the Ikkat uh, really from uh, uh, Pochampalli and uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the area, Koilagudam, uh, which is an area we work very closely with the artisans over there. But you know, the earliest reference to Ikat uh, comes from the Ajanta paintings around uh, 11, 1200 years ago, which shows that these traditions kind of continue. And it's so nice that we live in a country where artisans are still practicing some of these art forms. And this is really an attempt to help revive these art forms and take it to the global marketplace using the power of technology. The last slide, uh, I'm also excited that we are launching a new series, uh, getting the youth of India to help map our heritage. It's a fellowship that we are launching. And the whole idea is to get everyone interested and fall in love with the stories that make India. Because it's only when you start looking at them as stories, as and engaging with them that you start really understanding the depth, width, and the amazing uh, vibrancy of India's history. And we hope that through the stories that we do, the films that we make, more and more people fall in love with history, like we all are in love with history. And it kind of adds up, especially for the youngsters, I think, uh, because that's really the future of India. And uh, we are very conscious that whatever we put out is really there for future generations to see. So that's uh, the end of the talk. Uh, it's it's long, but I hope I didn't, uh, you know, ramble on. And I hope uh, you got some great takeaways from what we have been doing and what uh, we have been getting our viewers. Thank you, Mini. I think all of us need a moment to catch our breath. <laughs> more, more than you. <laughs> you know, I think Nitin and you uh, have not been uh, upfront and honest with us. 
you know, in, well, uh, you didn't give us your real background. I think you really are a professor of history. And uh, the way you have, uh, just your confidence flow and timing of the name, the way you were rattling out the names, I would have mistaken you for a professor of history in some, you know, university, you know, who studied all her life, not a journalist, business journalist at that. Uh, amazing that uh, in five years, you have been able to switch and switch so well. Fascinating. And uh, the second observation, of course, is it really took my breath away. I knew what was to come, but I really wasn't prepared by the, the scale of neglect, if I may use the word, as you uh, kind of enlightened us. Uh, I, I know many years ago when I spent a month and a half in Italy, I forget the exact name, but they have a minister who's in charge of all their heritage sites. He is different from the tourism minister. And, you know, Italy has uh, very large revenue from its uh, tourism industry. And even the, I remember going and seeing that first press where the first Bible was reportedly printed. It's so well preserved. Yeah. And the temple that you showed off Bombay, where the slums surrounding sewer lines, you know, leaking into that, very sad. And uh, before I take up some questions which have come in the chat, the other observation is, I think uh, today, this evening, this 45 odd people, we have 41 now, we had 45. We can all look back and say we were part of history of this uh, movement that uh, many men in, uh, started. I've just seen in the last few slides your community approach of building the maps. Very similar to what uh, Google Maps has done, right? Yeah. Today, Google doesn't need to employ people to update its maps. You, me, and everybody else is doing. And incidentally, we had the head of Google Maps uh, give us a talk from Singapore. Um, very interesting. Shano, um, he... It was so fascinating to know how you know Google Maps is built and how we take it for granted now, wherever we want to go. So looks like uh, you are on to something big, and I wish you every success. And I think uh, there are uh, many many questions, but uh, you know some have come to my personal box, some onto the chat. But let me start by. I, I do want to make one point. Many thanks uh, for for uh, being so kind in in your praise and and uh, you know your uh, you know uh, pat on our back for the work that we have done. But uh, I must give you all a statistic which will shock you. Do you know that um, if I'm not mistaken, in 2019, which was a year before the pandemic, where uh, you know we did have a lot of uh, tourism was still on, uh, India I think got about. 10 million foreign tourists, right? Mm -hmm. And Vietnam got more foreign tourists than India did. Yeah. And the figure for China was 75 million. So one of the things that, you know, comes really stares us in our face is how little we have developed our history or historic sites for tourism. Because I believe tourism and, and studies prove that tourism creates the maximum jobs in any economy. And whole economies, just look at Kenya, you look at anywhere in Europe, whole economies run on tourism dollars. And in India, it's the sad state in which we keep our monuments and our sites that, you know, has, you know, created this mess. Because I believe if tourism is encouraged, if we can work towards that, many of these sites can be self-sustaining, really, and allow scholars to do more interesting work around them. And it's really a pity that we don't think of it uh, hard enough. Right. Yeah, go ahead. So the first question I'd like to uh, present is uh, from Nitin. You know, the out of Africa theory is currently the accepted wisdom, right? Based on this uh, mitochondrial DNA studies. Is there anything in India in your research uh, that you have found to challenge that based on some hard evidence? And uh, the second question he has is, uh, what is the current state of excavations of the Sanauli site? Right. So Nitin, um, uh, the Jalapuram site is interesting because it kind of takes back the, the human occupation uh, uh, based on what, uh, what we found over there. Because initially it was believed that it is around 66,000 uh, 
years ago that the uh, uh, the African con contingent, if I could use that word, <laughs> frivolously came into India. And that too was, uh, it was because that they used the coastal route to come into India. So they would have first come down the coast, gone into, uh, uh, you know, the, of course, uh, it was, uh, the water levels were much lower. So there was a land bridge that was connecting uh, down to Indonesia and the islands and then to Australia. But now with the Jwalapuram, it shows that even in 74,000 uh, years ago, there was uh, a community of homo sapiens and that's interesting because we know that there are many many um, varieties of hominids and we've had uh, evidence of a lot of these hominid communities across India but the homo sapiens I think the Jwalapuram uh, excavations were very critical and important subsequently there has been something else found I'm, if I'm not mistaken in uh, West Asia itself also indicating an earlier date so you know one thought process is that it's still a work in progress because even the out of Africa theory is being uh, analyzed uh, in different ways. You know, Alice Roberts very famously pointed out that there was no intermingling between the Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals, but that has also been vetoed because there's evidence of Homo sapiens inter uh, mingling with the Peking man or with the uh, Neanderthals. So it's a work in progress, but a lot of work needs to be done. And and Live History India, you know, we must focus a lot more on this early period, which we haven't done, which I want to do, definitely. The other question you had was the excavation. Uh, just one, one thought on that. Actually, all of us have about 1%, 2% Neanderthal DNA. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine that, right? Absolutely. And this, uh, this has come through the last five, six years, right? Earlier, it was believed that Homo sapiens are absolutely pure. And uh, that's not true. Uh, the second question that you have, what is the current status of the excavations in Sonali? It is uh, going on. In fact, I was in touch with the team. Now they're opening up Hastinapur. So the new government's uh, focus is on a lot of the Mahabharata sites, which is okay. I mean, because many of these... See, uh, while the Gangetic Plain, the later Vedic period sites, you know, the, the cities that went on to become the Mahajanapadas, you know, the Kashi, uh, Ujjain, all of these sites are well known. Very little work has been done in the upper Doab, in the early Vedic period sites, you know, which is really, because you see the movement of, of, of course, they gravitated towards the more fertile um, Gangetic Plains, the movement uh, in that period. But the early period, you know, the, where the Rig Veda is written, for instance, which shows the reference to Kabul and the Yamuna Doab, that area, not enough work has been done. So I'm very glad that the government is doing that. And Sonali also is work in progress. But sadly, what happens in India is the moment a site like this uh, gets excavated or news comes out, everybody jumps the gun and talks about Mahabharata and the epics. And, you know, is this Ram's or, or you know, um, the Pandavas uh, graves have been unearthed and all that stuff. So it kind of becomes extremely um, difficult uh, to uh, keep a sane head and excavate these sites. So. It is being done, and we are keeping a close eye on that. The next one is from Vijay. Um, and he is wondering why Indian traditions did not have written records. You know, they did not feature them. The earliest written records are uh, Brahmi and uh, Karosti inscriptions on Ashoka pillars. Mm. But uh, this is in contrast to the Sumerians, Egyptians, and other cultures, you know, who had some kind of writing, you know, carving you know, inscriptions and stuff. I think. Um, uh, he was wondering why, in spite of all the advanced uh, or development of our ancient cultures, we don't have written records. Right. It's a very important question, uh, and it's uh, it can be answered at different levels. Though I must say that in the Harappans did have a script. It's it's sad that we've not been able to decipher it because it's been uh, largely interpreted as perhaps being a trading script. But in Dholabira, uh, it's a very interesting site. By the way, the the report on Dholavira hasn't come out as yet. Um, and despite the fact that for 15 years, teams were excavating over there, and we've got a special film on Dholavira with the archaeologists who excavated over there. And Dholavira, there's this famous uh, lettering, which is possibly the signage uh, as you enter the main gate of Dholavira with a script, but we've not been able to decipher it. Now, it's a very important question that why have we not uh, chronicled a lot of our history? Uh, there are smatterings of it. There are a lot of epigraphic records in temples, uh, especially Chola temples. You'll see them all covered with the inscriptions of grants, etc. There are lots of uh, inscriptions in um, older cave temples. 
But as a nation, we've not actually done a very good job in keeping our history. Uh, and a lot of this is, I think, because, you know, a lot of our focus has been on the Puranic literature, on, on you know, uh, the more um, faith-based literature, I think, uh, rather than the, the more um, mundane listing, you know, and I think the West has been very good at the mundane listing of things. And for a historian, the mundane listing is actually very important because it tells you a lot about the society, economy, politics, etc. In India, it's been oral traditions which have been added to in, in, in <clears throat> Purana is a great example. It's actually a collective wisdom of, of many, many people which have come in the form of stories. So it's a bit of a problem, but uh, historians are working hard to try and uh, get to a lot of these, uh, and it's a work in progress, as I said. Uh, the next question is, of course, um, you know, your lament about uh, history not being in the mainstream, be it in schools or in the government's policies or as a, as a country and uh, your call for communities mm -hmm. to rise up and take charge and really, you know, uh, protect these monuments. Is this uh, something that is found in other countries other than the developing con developed countries? Is there a common thread? It is. See, uh, it, the problem with India is that we have a lot of everything, right? So, I mean, for the government, it has to prioritize. I mean, do, do you look at, um, uh, you know, school, uh, uh, people joining schools or, or uh, healthcare or nutrition? There's so many things that you need to do. But, you know, the many countries, and we should not look at the West, you know, very often you have a tendency to compare India with a Britain or a France, where which are much more mature and they've gone through the learning curve. They've got very high per capita incomes. They can uh, focus on culture and history, et cetera. But in India, the challenges are more basic and you can uh, you know, understand the government's inability to spend, because I think out of all the departments, the ASI must be the poorest department, the Archaeological Survey of India. I don't think they have money for anything. And the last report I read was so appalling. That I must tell you that there are about a, 500,000 monuments in India, okay? I mean, if you actually look at it, actually look at it because urban monuments, you have sites, etc. And you know how much um, all of ASI, be it states and the center cover within uh, the gamut of ASI protection, they're only 8,000. Wow. So that's the delta that we are looking at, right? And I believe that it's only local communities that can come across and we, we must instill that local community sense, you know? Where, and it's worked very well. Sadly, it's worked very well in, um, in, society, in communities which are affluent because affluent communities understand the importance of, of culture. So in Mumbai, for instance, South Mumbai has three World Heritage Sites, which include the Elephanta Caves, the, uh, the CSMBS, uh, the, not the CSMBS, the, the Victoria uh, Terminus, which is the Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus, and the Art Deco and Gothic uh, structures, right? But the moment you come to the suburbs, Jogeshwari Caves, nobody's even bothered about it because it's not part of the Tony set of South Mumbai, right? And this happens in every city. So I think it's when there is affluence that people actually, um, you know, understand the significance of these cultural monuments or historical monuments and intervene at the community level. So we must, and I believe that uh, the forums like this are so important because we need to be the change that we want to see. And we need to facilitate that. And if opinion leaders, prominent citizens, people, especially Indians abroad, can start, uh, you know, spending some time, you know, looking at this or supporting causes like this, it will be so wonderful because we need to make this happen. I don't think I, there is anybody from outside who's going to come and help us with this. Great. Uh, I, I would uh, encourage all of you uh, to definitely visit and let me just try to show it to you here, the uh, Live History India site. And uh, you will find a lot of uh, uh, movies and articles as uh, Mini has uh, told us. Let me just share the screen. Are you able to see this now? Yes. Um, and that's the website. And there is, um, you can also become a <clears throat> uh, LHI member 
for a small subscription and you'll gain access to all these fascinating movies and uh, you can actually tour all these fascinating places that mini uh, described in her talk and um, without stepping out of your house just from your laptop or phone so i would encourage each one of you and i'll send out the link again uh, to uh, subscribe or just go to the website and you'll find all the details there right subha I, i would also like to add that uh, we have about 30 plus virtual tours of sites uh, we have over 70 authors and historians uh, on oh. on their subjects apart from all the 5000 articles etc and uh, for this session i'm very happy to share that we are offering a 50% discount for rhi circle memberships uh, now uh, for all those people who are attending this because we'd love to have you as part of lhi circle and uh, after this talk so i'm going to uh, sh share the link with you nitin sure. is already a member of uh, lhi circle and uh, last evening he was with us to uh, take a journey through the silk route with riaz uh, so we've got some fascinating uh, talks and um, and films lined up over there so all of you are uh you know uh please do check it out and join us on lhi circle and we are very happy to give you uh, a very steep discount so that you can enjoy live history india and also share it with your friends and family please just take a minute many to talk about the lhi circle and the subscriptions right so the you know uh, uh at at a level of course uh lhi circle is is a way of leveraging what technology offers today for the first time sitting out of atlanta like anything is or anywhere else you can be part of live discussions you can watch virtual tours you can travel to the deep corners of india and i think that's a very fascinating concept because it really uh, allows you to uh, uh, travel sitting on your couch so that is one of the reasons that we launch lhr circle because we believe that this is a huge gap that needs to be filled how many people will actually be able to go to dhola vira right you have to go to kach you have to go to bhuj you drive for 8 hours go to dhola vira to experience it and when you go to dhola vira you are not likely to get to know anything from the site itself because the signage and all the detailing is so badly done so the idea of lhr circle is to allow you to experience the place even before you go there so that when you go there you are well equipped to understand what it is all about so that's what we do and also of course at a different level lhi circle is our way to raise money for the work that we are doing because as we are going through india it's it's a very very uh, you know uh, resource exhausting kind of a uh, initiative because you know we really uh, have to map it by district and you know 5000 articles or 400 films on india is difficult to come by so we thought this would be a very nice way of getting people who are interested in indian history who want to contribute to indian history uh, to uh, be part of this movement because the money that we raise to bhai chai circle also goes back for our fellowship program for our various initiatives to kind of encourage um, people and communities to nurture their history and and work towards the conservation so we've done a lot of work with artisans with uh, local communities lending them a voice giving them a platform to run their campaign so all of this comes together so we thought we'll get history lovers to do something for india's history through this platform excellent thank you for that very generous gesture i have already shared the links in the chat box for everybody and i will send out an email of the link that many will send to us later Thanks, uh, Mini, for that very fascinating talk. Can I say something? Yes. Yeah, uh, Air Commodore Dr. Arora, who also traveled quite a bit. Yes, Dr. Arora. I'm just sharing you the fossils, which I, you know, collected at Yupitipat, North Siachen area. Wow. North, uh, this thing, Ladakh, in '73-'74. I was in army those days. and these are 77000 year old wow and these just show these were been under the tithus sea you know when uh, actually when continent. the indian continent yeah. it was in a you know lower pole south pole even australia was a part of it they moved up and they finally collided with the asian plate and the himalayas got created these are marine fossils can you imagine how lovely it's a beautiful thing we found huge 
these are very small we found huge 30 feet 40 feet what were those creatures we do not know because we are not aware 77000 years earlier what was there i happened to be a deep sea diver and saw that city of lord krishna it's a fascinating things are there you go to jungles of nagaland you will find 60000 years old fossils of big trees they are all calcified i've got few of them with me so it's interesting gavin what you have spoke this whole session there is a revival required in all the indians mind we should not forget about all these things these are there it is our right to protect them absolutely are you Both doing are, there are lakes are there i have dived on those they are very deep it looks like there is some different civilization which is all calcified hmm. speaking of that oh, yeah. Mindy, are you doing anything on marine archaeology not enough nitin not enough you know we did something on uh, on the um, site the pagodas in in mahabalipuram you know we had a marine archaeologist because a lot of new material has been found over there as well because that area is so um, you know uh, susceptible to uh, cyclones etc i am very keen to do it because one of the things that i have noticed in in pouring through history is around um, the early medieval period there was uh, i feel a cataclysmic uh, tsunami or some kind of a natural uh, event where two very big ports of india disappeared or you know kind of uh, fell off the radar one was kumpohar in the on the east coast and the other was patnam and there is uh, evidence to show major silting of rivers major uh, change in courses and most of our ports by the way were riverine ports you know we look at ports today like jnpt or you know the um, uh, vizag etc as open sea ports but they were not the case most ports were actually riverine ports and there has been something so i am very curious so you know what happens nitin is every time we do a story five new stories appear and then when you dig deeper you find six more questions and so it's like you know we can go on and on but a lot of gaps are emerging and that is you know it's good because as you are doing a systematic understanding of indian history these gaps need to be filled and and so we are going out looking for people who can fill these gaps so a lot of sleuthing is happening actually if, if you're looking for deep sea diver i think you just found one i know i know i'm quite <laughs> yeah, definitely we're going to reach out to you for your help Dr. Arora has a unique uh, you know, experience. He was in the army. He was in the air force. He's a medical doctor. He was heading the Apollo life uh, till recent, till before the pandemic, and he's got a very rich experience on you know war front and civilian time. You know, civilian type of experience. It'll be interesting. Maybe he can contribute to your site. You know, some article. I will yeah. send you, Dr. Arora. If you're okay, I will share your contact with Mini. And I've already connected you with Froka Mini, and Froka, I connected you with uh, Mini as well. So, with that, um, just for our uh, attendees, uh, some of you are new. Uh, uh, please join us on every third Saturday uh, evening at 6:15 on Zoom. One interesting talk we are going to have in the month of June is one of our other classmates' daughter. she is doing a phd in uh, university of southern california ucla 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 on uh, museums wow so she is going to speak about you know the origin history the importance relevance of museums and exhibitions how this whole concept came to be so just like today's topic i think we Uh, we have been having some talks which you know in a broad way they connect with each other like uh, professor atluri spoke to us and now today mini so do uh, log in on every third saturday with that i'd like to call our secretary mr subhas chandra bose to present a formal vote of thanks now narendra thank you subhas garu president of hostel hyderabad Sri Venkateswara Garu, distinguished speaker, Miss Mini Mena, family and friends of Sri Madhuri Deswaram Krishna Rao, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all 
for joining our 160th monthly meeting. This is the fourth meeting in our 14th year without a break. We thank the family members of Sri Ma Madhuri Sivaram Krishna Rao Garu for establishing an annual endowment lecture in his name in the month of April. We thank Srimati Surya Prabha Bandakavi for the annual logistic sponsorship for the month of April in the name of her husband, late Subbarao Garu. We are very happy that their daughter, Ms. Karuna Bandakavi, is with us today and spoke a few words about her father and Mr. Madhuri de Sivaram Krishna Rao. Sri Subbarao Bandakavi was an active and regular member of Foswell and it augurs well that the next generation is also participating in possible activities. Thank you, Ranga Krishna Tipirneni, for joining us from New Jersey and reading the prayer. Thank you, Mr. Nitin G. Dalvi of Atlanta, Georgia, USA, and for introducing the distinguished speaker. <laughs> the very engrossing talk delivered today by Ms. Mini Menon has introduced us to those forgotten aspects of our own heritage and history due to long foreign rule. There is often a hue and cry when the neglect and indifference to chronicle the factual and comprehensive parts of our rich heritage and culture are sought to be corrected. Life History India is a wonderful initiative to fill this gap. What makes it even more promising is that it leverages technology to reach millions of our countrymen, both young and old. I would encourage each one of you to visit the website www.livehistoryindia.com and subscribe to the LHI circle so you have access to fascinating videos and articles about the hitherto undisclosed jewels of our history. We thank you, Ms. Menon, for taking us on a virtual tour of India during this short talk. We laud Ms. Menon for the many accolades she won as a journalist. Thank you again, and we truly appreciate your time. We propose to continue with these Zoom meetings Till further notice, though restrictions have been removed by the government, we are hearing of a flare-up in some places like New Delhi, so we are taking a conservative approach to restart physical meetings given the age profile of our members. And also because several of our members have expressed that they find it convenient to attend the Zoom meetings for various reasons of logistics. If you have not already done so, please take the booster dose of the vaccine and diligently continue to follow COVID protocols. However much the situation appears to be returning to normal, our forthcoming monthly meetings are as follows. Saturday, 21st May 2022 at 6.15 p.m., Mr. Karthik Hariharan, Director, Apple Inc., Palo Alto, California, USA, will deliver a talk on Bitcoin Demystified. Saturday, 18th June, 2022, Miss Aditi Halbe, PhD student at University of California at Los Angeles, will deliver a talk on history of museums and exhibitions. On the uh, 16th July 2022 at 6.15 p.m. Dr. Prabhu Ellen Pingali, professor in the Charles H. Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management at Cornell University, founding director of the Tata Cornell Institute for Agriculture and Nutrition, will deliver a talk on why does agriculture remain unremunerative. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Till we meet on the third Saturday of May, the 21st, for our 161st monthly meeting. Stay home, stay safe. Thank you all.
Thank you, Boss Garu. Uh, thanks again, Mini, and uh, all you guys, Nitin, Krishna, Ranga Krishna, all of you who woke up early in the US and for joining us. So look forward to seeing you all. If you want to make some quick money, join the meeting in May. It's all about Bitcoins. So be there. Good night. Good night. Thank good you day. so much. It was lovely to be part of this session. Thank Please you. Please do send the link, Mini, and we'll share it with our members. Yes, I have, yeah, I'll do that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll close the meeting now. It's 8.15 exactly. We started at 6.30 and we're still sticking to our time. Thank you.